Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and a parent of a sixth grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide organization that works with families, educators, and leaders to create a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides an equal opportunity for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series seven years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is part two in our series about the role of K-12 schools in addressing racially motivated violence. From a long history of police brutality and racism targeting the black community, to a rise in attacks on the Asian American Pacific Islander community, we're continuing to see disturbing examples of racially motivated violence in the news. This past year, we have witnessed some of the largest protests in US history amidst a worldwide outcry against racial injustice. Since then, social movements have been thrust into the national spotlight with youth at the forefront of the conversation. Recurring incidents of racially motivated violence are impacting our youth in multiple ways but how should K-12 schools respond? In this webinar centering student voices, we have assembled a statewide panel of students, educators, and community organizers to discuss the impacts of racially motivated violence, presenting tools that can be used in schools to best support students on a daily basis. They will also answer your questions. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. And now I am excited to introduce our moderators. Denisha Saucedo is the 2018 Puget Sound Educational Service District Regional Teacher of the Year and a sixth grade teacher at Kent Elementary School. And her daughter, Alicia Saucedo, just graduated from Thomas Jefferson High School in the Federal Way School District and will be starting at St. Martin's University in the fall. Welcome, Denisha and Alicia. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, before we get started, I'd uh, just to like to start, a, start us off with land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on occupied Coast Salish land and that we live in a, and, and work on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle and the Duwamish people. We pay respect to the Coast Salish elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and all indigenous people. Um, to acknowledge this land is to recognize its longer history and our place in, in that history. It is to recognize the lands and the waters and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this region, who practice uh, spiritualities and were and are tied to the land and the water and those who live and continue to enrich and develop in relationship to the land, waters, and other inhabitants today. Um, okay. We would also like to recognize that the United States was built off the stolen labor of kidnapped Africans and enslaved Black people's work, which created the profits that created our nation. We also recognize the brown labor currently happening in Eastern Washington, California, and across this country. 
They are working under terrible working conditions for less pay, facing COVID-19 and racism in order to survive while providing food and other necessities we need. This acknowledgement is only one small step in a commitment to working for reparations and liberation for Black, Indigenous, and people of color every day. Don't ignore the Black led liberation efforts and resistance that is happening and has been happening. Materially support Black communities now and in the future. So um, before we jump into our questions, we'd like to ask each of the panelists if they would take a second to introduce themselves. And in these instructions, we're asking for two things. First would be um, your name, your role, and what is that one word <laughs> that you can think of or phrase that brought you, you here today? What made you say, you know what, lunchtime. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and look and give up my lunchtime to, um, to be here to have these um, difficult conversations. And I'm gonna go ahead and just mute myself. And um, as we continue on through this webinar, I'd like to just say that if you feel like it's your turn and you'd like to make sure that you're not talking over each other, just unmute and watch for the unmutes. <laughs> so then we can make sure that we're kind of just having a relaxed conversation together. And so um, I will start, Ms. Castillo. Um, as you all heard, uh, I am a sixth grade teacher at Kent Elementary. And the one word that brings me here during this time is, Sorry, I, my, my brain just literally went to it. To, I was going to give you guys two words and then I was going to give you an example that's not an actual example. And I was going to say, why not? And so I'm going to do it. Um, I always break my own rules. Why not? So those are my, that's my phrase. Why not? Um, who would like to go next? I'll jump in. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Wilson. I'm a para at Kent Lake High School. This is my fifth year in education. Um, working on my master's program so I can get back into becoming a teacher. Um, I actually have a phrase and that phrase changes from time to time, but it basically has the exact same message behind it. It is, uh, why not, why don't we have an open and honest conversation? And when I say conversation, I want to actually include dialogue because one person talking isn't a dialogue. It isn't a conversation. It's just one person getting their information out. If we share information and get um, an exchange of ideas, an exchange of cultures, then there'd be a bigger and better understanding of how we can live together and work together. Thank you. I can go next. Um, my name's Alicia Sacedo, like we said, you guys can call me Allie. And um, I'm also an Act 6 scholar going to be attending St. Martin's University. Um, and my one word why I'm here is love. My name is Jasmine Lenane Bowie. I teach world languages and cultures at Spokane Public Montessori. Um, and my one word for why I'm here is visibility, kind of. One word for everything Michael just said. <laughs> um, I can go next. My name is Rosie Jo, and uh, I just graduated from Ferris High School, and um, I'll be going to Columbia University in the fall. And my one word for why I'm here today is community. I think that's a great word. Um, yeah, thank you. I can go next. Um, hi, I'm Anvi. Uh, I just graduated ninth grade at Ferris in Spokane, Washington. And um, my one word for why I'm here would probably be personal, or if it was a phrase, I'd say, why us? Because I feel like this whole situation is so personal to me as like a first generation kid here, as a person of color in America. So, yeah. Um, hello, uh, my name is Bradley Carrera. Uh, I am a graduated senior um, from Thomas Jefferson High School. Uh, and then like Ali, I'm gonna be heading towards Gonzaga though, um, as an Act 6 student. Um, and my one word why I'm here, um, I would say empathy. Um, and then that phrase, um, just having a hybrid mentality and being open-minded to different cultures, different perspectives, um, and just being you know kind to everyone. 
Hello, I'm Nicole Jenkins Rosencrantz, and I work with Spokane Public Schools as the Director of Community Relations and Partnerships. Um, I also was a co-author of our equity resolution that was adopted by our Board of Directors last summer. Uh, my word is representation. Thank you. I'll go next. My name is Brett Allen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brett Allen. I'm a English teacher at Kent Reading High School in Kent. And my one word is duty. I feel a duty to be here as an educator, as a father, and as a Black person. I guess I'll go next. Uh, my name is George Breland. Uh, I'm a current principal at Cleveland High School in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I have been um, an educator for 27 years, a parent, a product of Seattle Public Schools, a proud graduate of Garfield High School. And uh, my one word is love, because like Alicia said, uh, love in the end will conquer hate. And so we need to come from that premise, uh, whatever we do. So thank you for having me. I think Lupita, it's like your. Uh, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> um, my name is Lupita Huerta, and uh, I'm also an ACTIC student that's going to St. Martin's. And um, I think, I guess, one reason that I'm here is community. You know, I think of myself more of a broad whole. And yeah. Awesome. Um, please stop me if someone didn't get to go, but I think we got everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for all your wonderful introductions. Uh, but now we're going to sort of jump into our first topic. Um, I do want to make sure that we or I encourage panelists, um, instead of like a strict like question answer format, we really want this to be more of a conversation. Um, and so while, yeah, our student voice, uh, we really want to, you know, give them space. We also ask our um, educators and adults in the room to ask questions of our scholars. Um, and yeah, to just kind of build that uh, conversation lens. Um, so now to sort of jump in, uh, I guess personally in school, I felt as if conversations mu much like these, you know, surrounding race or um, racial like violence have been hindered by this hierarchy that's in schools and um, this hierarchy in the classroom. The adult's perspective was uh, like taken into consideration more than the students and like the ability to have these conversations and address current events and reflect on past events um, were like restricted by our educators like comfort level and what they felt was like comfy for them instead of providing a space where like our thoughts and my thoughts could be um and my emotions could be spoken about i felt like i was walking around eggshells um to sort of protect like my teacher's feelings or ideas so with this dilemma that i've sort of pre presented in mind or like this hindrance that i felt um, I ask you all, how do you think this power imbalance um, in uh, schools or this power imbalance between students and educators um, affects how conversations surrounding racially motivated violence occurs? Um, so like, again, how do you think this power imbalance affects these conversations? So um, with that, I say you feel free to unmute. And um, like my mom said, if you unmute and you want to talk and you see someone else is unmuted, that will kind of <laughs> alleviate the chaos. But yeah. Yeah, um, maybe I can just start us out with this. And at least in my personal experience, what I've really experienced is that a lot of times these conversations, they don't even happen in the first place. They aren't allowed to happen. And um, I think there are many reasons behind that, specifically, uh, like you mentioned, teachers, you know, not wanting to make things uncomfortable in the classroom, um, not wanting to provoke any, like, controversial topics and so they kind of just try to avoid it and um, really don't promote any of that type of um, engagement from students and I think that is something that I really hope can um, can change at our schools is just having really open and honest conversations um, about things like race without feeling like it's uncomfortable or too controversial to talk about. Um, 
because I think having that kind of dialogue in schools is just really important and um, it can help a lot of students who normally, you know, at home um, in their own environments, they wouldn't really uh, ever be exposed to any of that kind of dialogue. Um, in schools, they can, they can talk about those things. And if it's not even um, really allowed or um, promoted in schools, then it's like, you know, they won't ever get exposed to it. Um, so yeah, I think uh, at least in my personal experience, I've just noticed that a lot of times teachers try to hide away from any tough topics like that when I think they should really try to um, promote that dialogue among students and um, encourage that and especially uplift the voices of uh, you know, uh, students of color in, in their classrooms. Ms. Rosie, I wholeheartedly agree 110% with what you just said, and, and I'm going to make it brief so that everybody can have a chance to talk. Um, the problem is that everyone is uncomfortable, and we have to accept that it is an uncomfortable conversation, is a, I'm sorry, uh, subject to talk about, but it has to be had in order for us to move forward. Uh, I can go next. Um, I was, yeah, along the same lines, I feel like um, the power imbalance really puts educators' ideas and comfort levels really ahead of anything that what the students might think. And a lot of the times, like, of course, educators are the ones creating the lessons plans, whatever, but educators should be, I don't know if they're right, encouraged probably to have these conversations with the students because it is really important not only for the educators to learn, but for the students to feel like their voices and ideas are being heard and even just to be represented because representation, especially for kids, is so important, especially in schools. And when they see educators promoting those conversations, they'll know that like it's okay to talk about, it's okay to learn about, and it's okay to like feel seen, especially when you see like, of course, an abundance of white teachers in our school systems. Like I feel like most of um all the teachers I've had have been white teachers. Like I've never seen a teacher who looks like me. And I feel like that's one reason why they feel so like, um, they feel like they can't have these conversations either because they feel like it doesn't affect them or they feel like they're too scared to hit like a controversial topic like that. And I think that um, because they feel that way, then the students' voices aren't amplified in the classroom, especially students of color. So if we can support educators to make these kind of conversations, it will really help students and students of color in the long run so that they can keep having those conversations. I have a, a question, um, kind of talking about this power imbalance and how and saying how we're we're not having the conversations i think for me personally i'm 30 years old this is my first time teaching i've never had a teacher of color and i think now being older i'm doing so much unlearning and relearning and new learning because in a lot of situations you don't know what you don't know right so there are some instances where you're in a classroom and you're just learning about math or you're learning about history the way you think uh, the way you're being told that it happened right and you don't know what you don't know so i'm my question to our scholars in on the panel are what responsibility or what in what ways can students kind of spark that change in their classrooms and kind of let their teachers know like hey we are ready for this conversation and we are needing this conversation. Yes, just feel free to unmute. Oh, it's, is it not working? Wait. There you are. Wait, did, did you see those messages? Those are not me. Um, I'm confused. Um, 
Yeah, I did not say that. I, I, my hands are right here. Yes, we. I think we have a spammer. I don't know if we can get. Yeah. That's. Is there a way to close the chat? Because I think we have a spammer. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. <laughs> okay. No worries. Let's let's not let somebody come into our conversation and distract us from what we're here from and essentially what we're here to do is to disrupt and so a lot of times there are people who are going to jump in and disrupt on purpose and so Bradley jump in let us know I'd like to bring us back to the question which is about the empower balance and then um, Jasmine also talked to us about so students like what can you do um, because what I'm hearing um, a lot of is like a you know, students feel like they need the exposure, but this is just the uncomfort. The uncomfort of teachers has created a situation in which the power that the teacher has. So um, you guys talked a little bit about the fact that teachers make the lesson plan, right? So that is the power because they are deciding what's happening. So what do we do about that, right? Well, how can we encourage? How can we move forward? What do you guys think? Um, I think I'll just speak on this a little bit. Um, what you touched on, especially the comfortability uh, aspect is really is really what prevents us from making those choices, from, prevents us from having those tough conversations. Um, that ability to be comfortable while being uncomfortable is like super important while having these conversations in the first place. Um, and like I said, being open-minded, my word for being here, empathy, um, and just taking that first step to have that conversation, taking that first step to you know, really present that subject towards your teacher, towards their classroom, um, towards your community, wherever you're at, um, and just providing that, have letting your educator know that these conversations are one that ones that we want to have and ones that we we need to learn more about, um, and that power and balance of having degree um, from an educator point of view, uh, it can be really really scary. Um, with that power of influence because you know you have influence on all these students in your classroom and if you feel like you make one word one mistake um then that bond can be broken that trust can be lost and those conversations um feel a lot tougher um and so i think just leap taking that leap of faith um and having those conversations and starting um is really important in the first place And we have a um, we have administ an administrator here, George. And I'd like to um, just as a teacher, like I'm thinking about that, right? I'm already that teacher that's cool with kind of breaking those, <laughs> uh, you know, uncomfortable. I don't I don't feel I need to be uh, comfortable. I feel like my students are the ones that need to feel comfortable, not me. Um, I've I went through school, <laughs> so like now is my, about me providing that space for them to also grow. And so I think about what Bradley said about like um, taking, that, taking that leap of faith, but maybe both you and Nicole can jump in a little bit and talk to us about like, well, how are teachers gonna be supported if they do that? That's why I hear our students saying like, they want, they want teachers to take the leap of faith, but. Well, I would say that uh, at Cleveland, we've been moving towards that the last couple of years of really trying to empower student voices and create uh, platforms to where students can give our teachers feedback and it is uncomfortable but it's necessary because our students don't come into uh, the school as blank pieces of paper right they come in with gifts and talents and strengths and if you're a really good teacher you should be getting feedback from your students because that will drive your uh, instructional pedagogy better instead of just assuming that you are the keeper of all the knowledge. So we created a principal advisory board that was different from the ASB because sometimes ASB can be a popularity contest because they vote on it, right? But we wanted students that may not necessarily have a voice to have access to the administration and have access to uh, the, the power structures and, and really try to uh, level that out to where we are actually listening to the students so we can better serve them. If we're not doing that, we're not doing what we need to do. And we're just perpetuating the system that was designed to get the results that it's designed to get. Um, so I would say, you know, it is our job to create those structures and that platform for our students to help us drive uh, our practice, 
Um, and I'll let Nicole go ahead and speak a little bit more about that. Yes, I, I my comment is very much on the same level what you're talking about. Um, so this year, as we've rolled out um, anti-racism training, what, the big thing that I'm telling all educators is that um, it's all about relationship. Like everything, it's about relationship. So, so even when you are trying to uncomfortably have this conversation, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to be all tingly, you know, with anxiety about it. You're going to get it wrong, but it's okay. And if you have that relationship, um, the students is actually going to respond to you in a forgiving manner if you are there in relationship with them. So that's where it, where it all starts. Um, and then the other piece um, about highlighting um, student voice. That is another thing that we really um, make a, a big push for in Spokane Public Schools is that um, we're not, and you talked about the ASB um, students, ver, you know, ver, so that's our other thing is like, I'm always asking, so how are you picking the students that are at the table that you're getting um, um, advice from, or they're telling you, you know, what's needed? How are we highlighting student voice? So this year we rolled out student listening sessions. And, and so that's very important. Um, to really come with an, an open heart and really um, know that just like in all relationships, there's gonna be rupture and there can be a repair, but you have to have that core relationship there. Yeah, I was gonna say, no. oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, Brett, you, you first, sir. Thank you, Brett. So the language we use around this, especially when it comes to People in the classroom, whether we're pre-educators or teachers, we, we that word teachers, which means like you know, like George mentioned, we're the holders of the knowledge. And really, it's in this conversation when we have these conversations. This is we're the facilitators. Like we're just managing the space so everyone has a chance to have a voice. Because what happens is teachers feel this need to be perfect, like was mentioned, and so they're too scared to even take a chance or a risk because they're supposed to be this model of perfection. When we're human beings too, and it is okay to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We have to have we tell the so our students all the time, our scholars that have a growth mindset, but we're not willing to have one around this stuff. Or most educators aren't. We know there are some of us that are. But there's also this idea that, well, you know, we're, we're the gatekeepers, right? But but really we're facilitators. We're not gatekeepers. We shouldn't be putting the gate on anything. We should be opening the gates wide open for everybody to come through. And so I think this some of the language we use around this can be changed so that educators feel a little more comfortable being uncomfortable because we know all especially the adults in the room and I'm sure these students who were telling us all these achievements that they have and where they're going in life anything anytime you've grown as a as a human being it's because you went through a period of discomfort like you can't grow and evolve unless you go through that discomfort so if we can remind ourselves of that as human beings and remind ourselves that nobody none of us has to be the leader or the, the teacher but just a member of the community on the same level with the students, I think that would be helpful. So the more we can use that language around each other, each other I think the better. Yeah, Brad, where I was going was, um, actually I wanted to refer to what Ms. Rosencrantz said, and this is for specifically for Bradley. Um, if we have that relationship with that other person, we are able to have some form of comfort in, in starting that dialogue. If you don't have that relationship, that's where you start to build it. If they're uncomfortable, it's going to be uh, accepted. And the only way they're going to get comfortable is by trying to start a relationship with someone over a subject matter that they have no knowledge of or very little knowledge of. And that's where the dialogue starts from having that dialogue and exposing more information and bringing the coming together of differences. Oh, thank you. I, um, that honestly makes me think about like the program that a lot of you, so Bradley, Ali and Vita, you're all Act Six scholars, and it's all built around leadership. Um, I don't know, Lupita, did you wanna? Do you wanna add anything about that empower balance? Or I kind of think about you guys, and I think about the idea that you guys are moving on to this next step with given this title of leader, and how is that going to uh, impact or change 
how you expect your college uh, teachers to allow you to be able to have these conversations. Um, because this is not just an issue K-12, right? It's also in higher ed. What are your thoughts around that? Um, I can definitely say like, in my K through 12 experience, I really didn't have any support like that, except there was this one program that I was part of that kind of allowed us to talk about um, issues in our community and, you know, in a broader spectrum. And we would go to like Olympia and we would talk about like certain bills that could like uh, that um, could impact us. And um, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of hard to have sometimes dialogue with teachers because as everybody has said already, like, you know, they're uncomfortable. And I think they're kind of um, worried that other students might be uncomfortable as well. I know it's kind of hard to talk about these kind of problems with my other friends that are not um, people of color because <laughs> they're like, oh, well, I, you know, I've never experienced it. So, but it's just like, oh, okay, never mind. I don't want to talk about it. But it's, I'm kind of looking forward to going to school and, you know, advocate for a space where we can kind of have these conversations and, have more dialogue between a lot of other students. I think that would be kind of interesting. Yes, I, I completely agree. And I think, um, I mean, we're all here today, so we're all willing to sort of do the work and, you know, put in the time. Um, and I think we've done a great job already of just like establishing this foundation and saying like, these are the limitations that, you know, we face when we try and tackle these like really emotionally di charged discussions. Um, but now I kind of want to shift our discussion and ask, um, how do you think we can alleviate this uh, power imbalance? Like, I know Mr. Wilson said, you know, building relationships and just creating, uh, like Bradley said, empathy. And I just want to ask you guys, like, how do you think we do that? How do you think we build these relationships? We create empathy um, among staff, students, and just sort of alleviate these feelings that um, our students and kind of our staff are having. Yeah, um, well, I think what uh, Mr. Wilson said earlier about like relationships, that's, that's really key, honestly, because I think when um, teachers can really express to their students, like saying that, hey, I'm not like, you know, super above you in any way, like, I'm just, I'm just here to really help you um, try to, you know, understand what you're going through and um, be your biggest supporter. And when students understand that from a teacher, I think that's when they can really feel like they actually belong and um, they can actually learn to their best ability. Um, I think a lot of teachers now, they don't necessarily make the effort and um, that you know just leads to students feeling very disconnected from the teachers and just the education system um, in general. And so, yeah, really just trying to um, have teachers uh, try and make connections with students. I think that'll create greater empathy among um, the school. Um, and then I also think that uh, definitely like in, um, for example, history and English classrooms, I think incorporating curriculum um, that really highlights, uh, you know, uh, people of color, for example, in English classes, you can have lots of literature um, written by, uh, you know, authors of color. And then um, in history, big thing that I've, you know, been really passionate about and tried to advocate for is um, I, I never really saw much Asian American history represented um, in history classes. So, uh, just having you know, curriculum that accurately um, portrays history and really shows the full story. Um, and sh I think we lost Rosie. I think I might've froze there for a second. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Did I like break out? Yeah, just a little okay. bit. I think your, your picture's still frozen, but we can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. You're fine. <laughs> So Rosie, if you want, just um, 
we'll we'll move on to someone else and then jump right back in okay sure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I can speak to this. Um, so I think like, I'll take my experience from this year, for example. So I noticed that we only really brought up conversations of like, race or privilege specifically in my English class when we learned to kill a mockingbird because it's ninth grade. And um, I was actually my English teacher was the one who put me here to this, uh, to this call. But um, I feel like that was the one classroom where we actually had a conversation. And I feel like the one big thing that I noticed was that like, I'm the only person raising my hand to like talk about privilege. Like not only the educators are feeling uncomfortable, but the students aren't feeling comfortable to talk about these issues or if they are, they're taking very like, they're not going as into it as a person of color might feel or how their ideas might like differentiate from white people. Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's just like, that was my experience this year. And I feel like we have to teach educators to be allies and we have to teach them how to teach because students aren't like, if students haven't been exposed to these kinds of things before, they're not gonna know how to talk about them and neither are educators. So educators have to learn about it so that they can teach us to learn about it and have these conversations with each other, not just with educators. Um, can I just jump in and say yes? And it, I, I kind of want to circle back just a little bit because I'm like, yeah, um, can, a really quick go around. When's the first time you got to have a conversation about race? Like at what age? Like at what grade? And so if you think about it as a teacher, I didn't, those were jumped around. I went to Kennedy and, you know, where Brett teaches now. And I, those conversations still weren't really happening. They were jumping around. I didn't have my first conversations about race until college. And so I'd like to know, because it sounds like what you're saying is, is that we need to start early. <laughs> So kindergarten, right? We need to start early and we need to keep going. And teachers, because how are we going to learn it? How are teachers going to learn it? They're also going to experience it. So we start now, those, those kindergartners become teachers and we teach the teachers, right? And so I would say college. Everybody want to unmute real quick and say, when's the first time you got to have a conversation about race? College. I don't even know. I think for me, it's even after college. <laughs> I would say college, but I didn't feel like I was a part of the conversation. This year, so senior year. I think like the first time I ever got to talk about race and how it's impacted me is when I did my senior, like I did a I had a speech for my senior graduation, and I think that's like the first time I actually got to like talk to everybody about like what it's like. So yeah, I agree. Um, I think it it start with my my essay about diversity um, and and my side of the story um, when applying to Act Six. Um, so this year, uh, along with Ali and Lupita. Yeah, mine would be this year as well in the school. I was trying to wait to make sure that I was the very last one, and I don't think that I am. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and claim the fact that I must be the oldest one here and that I have totally different experiences than everybody here. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, which was all Black. I had all black teachers growing up from kindergarten all the way through until I got to college is when I first had uh, exposure to white educators. Uh, my exposure to race, the race conversation was probably second grade. At that time, there was one book out um, that had anything to do with uh, our culture being contributors to society that book the name of that book was called great negroes past and present to give you an idea how long ago that was this was 1962 i believe 62 and my assistant principal was black principal was uh white and we talked about everything uh, that students at other school, white students at other schools were learning and that we needed to learn the same things 
because we were going to have to compete in society with those students, even though we were the same, there was a huge difference. Rosie, not sure if you, did you hear the question? Yeah, I think I, sorry, I, my computer is freaking out, but I'm back again. Um, the question was when, when we first have conversation about race in school, um, right? And so I think I would definitely, it was definitely like in high school, um, probably, uh, let's see. Well, like in ninth grade English, we kind of um, talked about it when we read To Kill a Mockingbird. But like that wasn't really in depth. Um, I think when I got into uh, US history, my sophomore year of high school, um, my teacher was much more open to having conversations like that. So I was really thankful um, for him. And so um, I would say probably that was when I really had the first conversation. I would say uh, <clears throat> kind of similar to Michael Wilson, uh, growing up in the Central District of Seattle, uh, when the Central District was predominantly Black, my first principal was Black. And most of my principals and a lot of my teachers were Black. And so my first conversation about race was in the home, number one. And uh, my parents, being from the South, taught me, you know, how to survive, how to, how to be successful, how to, you know, be a young African-American young man and be, be alive, number one. Number two, I would say that probably in middle school and high school, we began to talk about race because I was in the busing era. So a lot of my neighborhood uh, kids were, were, were bused um, to the north end of Seattle. And so that was an interesting experience. But uh, I would say it depends on like where you're from and, and, and the era that you were from, but uh, it happened early. It, it started in the home with me and then, you know, early on in school. I, I too went to Seattle School District during the busing era, so I, I definitely understand you too, Brett. Wow. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I, I think you know, overall, this is just, um, it, you know, I just want to kind of frame just a little bit of what I just heard uh, time. And, you know, I, as, as a mom, I could tell you, uh, Ali, I can share this kind of embarrassing thought. Like when you don't experience having those difficult conversations, you don't always necessarily pass them on at home either. You know, my family migrated from Jamaica and a lot of that stuff was like in school and it was very like this. And so my mom expected that that's the way it was going to be here. Right. And so she was constantly moving us. And when it was, we weren't getting what we needed out of the schools, you know, so we were moving, moving, moving. I, we left the central district, went south, south, further south. We ended up away. Um, and so, you know, my four year old daughter was like, So you're not Mexican? <laughs> and she's like, Huh? Right. You know, because her dad's Mexican. So she's like, Well, dad's Mexican. Like, what's going on? You know, and so, yeah, we started those conversations at four. <laughs> But, you know, it's like, no, sweetheart, you know, but, but that was because I had a in, very inquisitive child who was like, you better tell me what the heck is going on, <laughs> right? I don't know if I would have started that conversation at four had she not, you know? And so um, it's difficult when we as parents then have to go ahead and try and figure it out because we don't know, you know, what's, what's happening. So I'm going to go ahead and let Ali frame this last question before we run out of time. Yes, we are almost out of time. Um, but I think a common like theme here is just has just been communication. I know um, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Bulin, you guys talked about how um, you guys had educators who kind of like uh, looked like you or reflected your students and how that had um, value in sharing those experiences. And, you know, when when someone can speak from their heart and teach people, um, it really helps a lot. But we don't always have that luxury. And so um, I just kind of want to bring up this last uh, question about communication and about how that's so important, especially when we don't all come from the same place and we don't all come, you know, we all have unique ideas, even if we do um, share like ideas, share common things, uh, it's not all going to be the same. Um, so we, I just kind of want to ask like, um, in what ways can communication sort of uh, build up like this conversation we've had here today? How can communication be used to sort of um, 
yeah, help these conversations surrounding racially, uh, racial violence and like what supports in schools would you like to see put into place? I just want to say something real quick. As an English teacher, I'm all about personal narratives. We get caught up in data and numbers. I can see Mr. George nodding because he's a principal, so he has to deal with all that. But really, it's it's personal narratives that really drive change in with these these types of conversations. So I think having that space in terms of, you know, like Ali's saying, in terms of how we communicate these is giving teachers space to share their personal narratives with their students and then hearing them back and being able to compare and contrast. And like Michael was saying, then you build this understanding and you start bridging those gaps and you can then then it opens the doors to other things. So really just being able to have that space to share those personal narratives, which really isn't a part of too many people's curriculum as an English teacher, I can sneak that stuff in there, but I think we need space and time for that. I think going well, off of that, oh, go ahead, Michael. Abs absolutely not, you first. I just wanted to follow up off of what Brett was saying about making that space and what Anvi was saying about how teachers need to learn, right? So in buildings, especially where the teachers, maybe you have predominantly white teachers, giving them space to ask questions and learn and be vulnerable, because I think that's a big fear um, amongst white educators that I've heard from is that the fear of making mistakes, right? Or the fear of, um, I think it was Nicole who was talking about earlier. It's like, it's gonna be uncomfortable, right? Human growth and development is uncomfortable, but we all learn it, right? In <laughs> some way, shape, or form. And it's just leaning into that discomfort. But again, providing those spaces and going back again to what Nicole said about, it's all relationships, right? So when thinking about communication, how are you communicating? How are you creating space for communication student to student? How are you communicating student to teacher? How are you providing communication and space amongst teachers and administration within a building and then to that district level? So all of those different types of relationships are, are founded on communication and what that looks like and what that space looks like. So if we can, if we know it's important to create space for students to express their feelings and questions and fears, then teachers need that space as well. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to do it with their students. So setting up those spaces for every, every level, I guess. And what I was about to say was that um, exposure is extremely important. Denisha and Brett have heard me say this, and this is something that I've used for decades. You cannot be what you can't see. So we were exposed at a young age to all of these people who contributed to society. Misty Copeland, um, Nikki Giovanni, uh, long before um, we had uh, Dr. Angelou and, and all of these other famous writers. Um, um, I'm drawing a blank right now because I'm trying to say so much, but there's so much out there that we have done to contribute to society that has not been exposed to our kids and has not been exposed to them as well. When I say them, I'm talking about the white educators and the white students who haven't learned anything about us other than the fact that we are athletes. They know nothing about our contributions to academ academia. So thank you. Yeah, and I just wanna really like kind of echo that sentiment. And um, I think uh, what Ali had brought up in her question was like, what kind of support systems can we have in school? And I don't know if I cut out before I said it, but yeah, like kind of along the same lines, um, making sure that in curriculum, the contributions um, and history of marginalized groups is represented accurately. And because um, I think that's just so important towards uh, kids, you know, learning the, the real history and seeing how all of these different groups have contributed to our country and um, really how they make up the country and make um, America what it is today. And just having that um, in schools and so all students know about um, know about that is really key, I think, towards creating that greater empathy that we had um, mentioned earlier and just having just better school environments for, um, for all students. 
I want to jump in too, Rosie, that, man, I hear students talking, I'm like, brilliant. And then I want to tie this between, this is what our students are thinking, this is what's happening, like, even at, like, district or even, like, um, you know, that communication that, so me communicating with my students, but then how is my principal communicating with me as to what's happening? Or how is the district communicating with my principal? And, like, how is this? all tied together how are my students communicating with their parents you know um vice versa like how is all of this streamline of communication um how are we going to get this to change like the culture of what we're doing here you know what i'm saying so i don't know um you know i don't know if anybody has anything to add to that but that idea of like you know yeah how's my principal communicating that to me or how am i communicating to my principal that i'm uncomfortable right i'm not the one uncomfortable but <laughs> Just you know, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. However, <laughs> um, kind of what I, I was thinking about, um, and it kind of goes with Rosie was talking about, about curriculum. And I think about kind of some big changes that our district has done just in a year. Um, and one of the parts of the equity resolution is a multicultural club in every single school. Um, and so, um, and then when I think back to um, the curriculum piece and how our, um, our new American Perspectives curriculum, that came from a multicultural student group um, at one of our high schools um, talking about um, like, how do we make our, have our club during the during the school day so that we can still go do sports and stuff after school activities. And then from that came to, um, well, why would we have a club? What's, it should be a class. And then how should we, so all of that came from students saying, this is what we want. This is what we'd like to, to see. And so really um, figuring out how we make those spaces because our students are brilliant. Um, and, and not just saying, um, yes, we value student voice and then never following up on anything that they say that they would like to see. I mean, you know, so really making those structural changes um, that even after we aren't, like I'm not at the district anymore, that stuff is still moving. Um, and so I, I, so I, that's not an answer to what you were saying, but I just, I really wanted to share that whole piece about um, really um, lifting up student voice and how we can um, kind of systematize that, how important it is. I'll just be brief, but when I look at the the word of uh, communication, I think uh, communication for me as a as a leader, anybody in a position of leadership means that you're speaking and you're listening. But a good leader is a better listener than speaker. So all of the the, the through line of what I see and what, what the conversation we're having here is that. Students need to be listened to, they need to be valued, they need to be seen as what they are, they're seeds of younger <laughs> adults, right? And we have to seed into them. The other piece is all of the people that we have on here are uh, a people of color in that we wanted to be acknowledged and seen through history that we made a great con contribution to America as it is. It's not that we're anti-white or this or that, but we just want to be heard, we want to be treated and valued for what our ancestors did and our gifts and talents, what we can give to this nation. And so it's about being heard, being seen, but it's also for people in power, it's about listening. If you're not a good listener, you will not be a good leader. If you're not a servant, you will not be a good leader. And that's what I live by. That's what I believe. And um, I'm just I'm just happy to be a part of this panel, but I, I I just see that theme, and commune is also family, communing together and building relationships and becoming family. So we are all families, only one race, in my opinion. Race is a European construct, by for those of you who don't know, but we're all one race, one people. I know. I was yeah. like, it's so beautiful. I don't know how <laughs> I know I can't talk that. No, <laughs> just kidding. But um, I did see one question um, in which is just asking like the percent of budget um, at like the district level that goes into these types of trainings and supports. I don't know if anyone here has that information or can answer that. Um, 
from a student like perspective, I would argue it's probably not enough just because of what we see. Um, <laughs> but of course, that's not like an educated um, like number or anything. And then I see one other thing that says students are teachers. And I love that because we're all we all teach each other. We all uh, grow and learn. Um, and teachers are also students. And so um, I just want to say I love that. And I think it's time for us to wrap up. So I will pass this. <laughs> Yeah, um, I we will we will pass it over in just a second. I do want to add one last thing um, that one people line just so you guys understand like that is critical. And so if you take anything away from this, um, I want to to read you guys our words for why we were here. You know why not? Love, visibility, community. Why us? Personal, empathy, representation duty, love, and love will conquer hate, and community. And then I want to end with the we are one people. Um, my family migrated from Jamaica, and anything um, out of many, the one is what you will see on almost anything that you get um, from Jamaica. And so let's take something from that little island down there, and let's uh, remind ourselves that we are one people, but in order to be one people, we have to suffer together. And our, you know, our our students are suffering, right? Our students are suffering and it's at the hand of us as educators. Um, we are not letting them um, breathe. We're not. We really need to do a better job of framing our classrooms and giving them the power. And so um, if there's anybody that has one last word, Bradley, um, Lupita, Brett, Michael, Nicole, Ali, Jasmine, Rosie, George. Like, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I know that um, there are continued conversations because we don't always even get to half of the conversation uh, questions that we want to. And so please, please, please be willing to come back. But did anybody want to drop a last line or feel like they had anything else to say before we are, you know, before we're done? Yes. Bradley, I just, and then, uh... Yes. I just wanted to say, I mean, like a common theme that I've seen from all of this um, is just exposure. Um, exposure at a young age um, helps a lot. Um, and then researching, education, learning, um, and then growing uh, has been a, a huge common theme. I've seen a lot um, that ties into communication. So when you're able to learn these things at a young age um, or even just have these conversations in general, um, it, it becomes easier to connect and to grow and to um, be able to create relationships, better relationships with other people around you. Um, and, and yeah, that's what I wanted to highlight. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for inputting some very, very wise input um, and very much needed conversation um, around this, co this topic. Um, and so I just wanted to thank everyone for, for jumping in here. And it was great to meet you all. Yay, and Envy, I think I forgot you when I was going around the screen because like my hand was, was like, whoa. So thank you, thank you, yay. So um, I think we, that's it. We are done. Do we have any housekeeping that we need to cover? Um, we, we do. And, um, okay. it, and um, if anybody else has any last words too, yeah. uh, I can take a minute and do that. <laughs> Because I saw Brett, that you unmuted for a moment there. So if there's something you wanted to say, go for it. And I'm going to disappear. That was by action. I ended up putting it in the chat. I'm just, it's so cool to see these powerful young folks and just knowing that we're passing the torch to some, to people much better than us, powerful, powerful people starting at a young age. Just proud to be with, here with you. All right. Well, thank you, Denisha, Alicia, Anvi, Bradley, Lupita, Rosie, Brett, Jasmine, George, Michael, and Nicole. And thanks to all of you for participating. Apologies for the chat being hacked. That's never happened before, and it will never happen again. Our next webinar is next Thursday, July 1st. Although it has been 20 years since the tragic events of September 11th, Islamophobia is still a challenge in Washington State Schools. In this webinar, we've assembled a statewide panel of students, educators, and community leaders to describe the impacts of Islamophobia and share strategies and resources to address Islamophobia when it arises. 
they will also answer your questions. Spanish interpretation and closed captioning in English will be available. The registration info is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinars. I'll also include the information in the follow-up email, which you'll be getting in your inbox in about 24 hours. And please save the date for our statewide free virtual event on October 7th, featuring former U.S. Education Secretary John B. King Jr., President of the Education Trust, and Dr. Vin Gupta, public health physician, professor, health policy expert, and regular health policy analyst for NBC News, MSNBC, a contributor for the New York Times and CNN, will be focusing on supporting students impacted by COVID. First, we're going to explore the academic impacts from a nationwide perspective, and then the mental health impacts on students during the pandemic. Then join us as we break into groups to discuss how we can support students across Washington state moving forward. I'll include the information in the follow-up email as well. Thanks to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Denisha, Alicia, Anvi, Bradley, Lupita, Rosie, Brett, Jasmine, George, Michael, and Nicole, thank you again for joining us and for sharing your wisdom, your insight, your perspective, your truth. And thank you for all you do for Washington students and families. I hope you have a great rest of your week.